Welcome, everybody. Welcome to LA Progressive. Today, we're talking with Ari Honervar. Am I saying that right? You are. An award-winning writer, speaker, and artist who writes for a number of publications, including Newsweek, Guest Magazine, The New York Times, among others. And she fled her native Iran after the fundamentalist Islamic revolution there in 1979, began crushing women's rights, demonizing marginal groups, and imposing morality police on the people. You were quite young then, a, a child really, but can you describe what you saw in Iran before the revolution and how that revolution changed people's lives around you? Right, so I was six when women lost their rights to sing or ride a bicycle in public. Of course, before the revolution, women were judges, they held um, very uh, esteemed positions in the government and all over you know, the professional world. And uh, girls like me could do whatever boys could do, at least to the extent that uh, we were comfortable with. I could climb trees and be seen with my best friend who was a boy. And then when the revolution happened, all that changed. I couldn't ride a bicycle. I had to cover my hair. I couldn't be seen without a chaperone with a male uh, relative. And we literally had to sit on the back of the bus as women. If you were a woman, you had to sit on the back of the bus, kind of reminiscent of the pre-desegregation era in the U.S., and this was incredibly unjust for me. Every single uh, right that was taken away was an assault to me as a person, as someone who, even as a six-year-old, as a seven-year-old, I knew I had my rights um, and they were being taken away. So I cut my hair short and I pretended to be a boy to enjoy some of those freedoms. Mm -hmm. But that only lasted uh, just you know, a little period of time before people were like, hey, that's a girl. We can't have her be out there uh, doing all the things that she's doing. So many of those repressive measures are still in place in Iran. And what was going on with the people of Iran? Did they did they largely support the revolution and support these measures? Or were they asleep at the wheel? Or what was going on with many Iranians? So in the beginning, it seemed like the majority of Iranians supported the uh, revolution. There was corruption in, you know, as there are, there was a dictatorship, there was a monarchy and people were like, well, maybe this is not the way to go because there is a, such a, a large income disparity. There is poverty, there is, um, you know, silencing of uh, political dissonance. And uh, and all of that led to the revolution. But then we later found out that just recently CIA made uh, these different deals with Khomeini, who was this unknown cleric who had been exiled to France a long time ago. And all of a sudden, all these foreign radios like Voice of America and, and British run um, types of BBC, they started doing, you know, showing his speeches or broadcasting his speeches. And he, there was all this propaganda behind it. And, you know, he was this from this very unknown cleric to someone that everyone was like, yes, he, this is him. This is someone who could save us, who could bring uh, justice and a more uh, moral society. And um, and so he promised that women's rights would be intact. He promised that we would have the best democracy in the world. And of course, none of that came to fruition. And as soon as Reagan took, um, took uh, presidency, the hostages were released. The Iran Iranians had taken over the American embassy and there was this big deal and Reagan and the Mullahs had made a uh, deal behind the scenes. And, uh, and then it turned out that um, as soon as he took presidency, the hostages were released. And, and um, then this whole thing started happening with uh, the crackdowns on civil liberties 
uh, where hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets and they were met with batons and tear gas and uh, a lot of violence. Um, you know, they were just demanding women's rights and every single uprising since then has been systematically crushed up to the recent uprising last September following the death of Mahsa Amini, who was a 22-year-old Kurdish woman and her hijab wasn't proper according to the morality police and she was uh, she died in the custody in police custody and uh, her family and uh, the local news said it was because of the treatment that she received the beatings that she received while in police custody and this sparked a massive uh, uprising that is supported by um, many, many countries around the world, I mean, many citizens around the world. And it's uh, you know, on par with women's rights and what we're going through in the US too. Yeah, that's that's in particular what interests me about your, your recent writings that I've read is this comparison. I mean, here in the United States, especially lately, but really over some 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 number of years, We've had attacks on women's rights, attacks on LGBT rights, the whole anti-woke campaign. So can you compare and contrast? I mean, what you saw as a child in Iran with what you've seen in recent decades here in the U.S.? Yes. So the moral panic is uh, something that is used by uh, the theocratic regimes, the dictatorships, to uh, and, and children, of course, is the place where they go to you know you're like you start talking about indoctrinating children um you know protecting protect you know protecting them from indoctrination protecting them from abuse and uh and then attacking marginalized groups that you assign blame to in child abuse which is basically disinformation and politicizing uh independent institutions um, going after individual journalists, going after journalism, period. That's kind of something that we are seeing more and more with retaliation against uh, people who expose, uh, you know, different atrocity, different uh, social justice issues in the world of journalism. Um, and this is very similar. So you basically start with moral panic, you otherize marginalized groups, you dehumanize marginalized groups, and then you start stripping away rights. And uh, that's, you know, women's rights were cut in half in Iran. And after the, in the post row world, I was like, oh my God, this is so similar to what we saw in Iran where uh, the Guardian Council, which is a group of mullahs, they decide what can be done and what can't be done. And right before the overturn of Roe in the in Iran, uh, the they were trying to get uh, a little bit of more abortion rights, like after 16 weeks, and if mother's life was in danger, if the fetus was unviable, and all of those things, and the Guardian Council was like, nope, that's not cool. So we're, we're, we're just going to reject that. So the legislators had no uh, say in what happened. The Guardian Council was doing what uh, basically was the law of the land. And with the Supreme Court, with no checks and balances, we kind of see a similar trend. They can do whatever they want. They're not, uh, there's no oversight um, on how they rule. There's a lot of conflict of interest. And that's the other side of the morality police. The other side of the co coin is the corruption. P you get people so involved in fighting for their rights because their rights are just being taken away one after another that then you can have all these corporations come in, all these moneyed interests come in and, uh, you know, take away whatever they want and take over uh, the government. I mean, they take over um, profit, just increase their own profit. Uh, while people are fighting, busy fighting for their own rights. Yeah, what's what's sad and and tragic really is is a fairly small percentage of Americans and 
might have been true of Iranians as well, really support the re repressive measures against gays, women's rights, and so forth. And yet once they get in place, once it changes, once the repressions get in place, it's it's darn hard to reverse. It's quite hard to reverse. And and it's always, um, you know, studies show it's just between five to 10% of the population that that can you know, take, do go one way or the other. The other extreme, the other um, side of the spectrum, I should say, is the Nordic countries, the example of Nordic countries right. uh, that were very authoritarian, very um, poor and uh, violent societies. And uh, within a few generations, because they promoted self-cultivation and adult education and becoming co-authors of democracy, these retreat centers, um, they uh, they promoted that. And they just allowed that for uh, the farmers and for villagers and for everyone to, to uh, partake in this education and how to build better relationships. And within a few generations, they went from authoritarian and uh, poor societies to vibrant, thriving democracies. And we're talking Norway um, and Denmark and Sweden, which uh, is, um, is still, you know, like a case study to to really pay attention to. And right now we have about 10% or fewer people who are very committed to extremism and they're kind of careening our country to, towards uh, extremism and theocracy. So yeah, you talk about social emotional learning in the, in the, in the Scandinavian countries. So, so how, how would we go about implementing anything like that here in the US? So right now there is an active war against social emotional learning at school uh, where groups, uh, Christianist groups, kind of like Islamist groups, are anti-social emotional learning, learning. They don't want empathy to, to, to be taught at schools. And, uh, and that has a root in this. Uh, um, there was a 2019 study that right-wing views are kind of, um, you know, the less you have empathy, the less you have, um, the more you tend to be toward authoritarian and right-wing views. So, so there is a, there is reason why they're trying to restrict um, teachers and schools from teaching empathy at school. And empathy is just one part of it, but how to have relationships. So how do we how do we do this? How do we implement it, implement this right in the US? Well, uh, in uh, in the 1960s, Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks went to folk schools that were inspired by the Nordic example of self-cultivation. And there's always like a social justice piece when you start having really good relationships with your own body, with yourself, with each other, then you start looking around and saying, okay, who else is vulnerable in my society? You know, when you're fulfilled that way, that's our natural tendency to just look around and care for other vulnerable populations like um, I know in a lot of neighborhoods in California, we see a lot of houseless people. And I'm sure if we got together as neighbors, that would be one of the first uh, things that we would try to address more holistically, not just try to to criminalize uh, homelessness and, um, you know, do things that don't historically haven't worked in decreasing homelessness. So um, the my I, one idea that I have, and and I'm kind of starting in the initiation initiative um, ways of looking at how we can implement this, is that if instead of or if in addition to every Starbucks, say in every neighborhood, we had a community center that uh, provided uh, uh, meals, just something so simple as having something that's served dinner, dinner, a place that you can walk to in your neighborhood and that served dinner. We have overworked parents who, you know, the last thing they want to do is come home and make a nutritious meal for their kids. And if you had that, and if you got talking as people more in-person interactions, 
And then afterwards, people again go to different workshops. Um, you know, some people would be interested in uh, democracy and how to support local candidates, or some people would be interested in in uh, just learning a craft or be you know play games, sing things that nourish you, nourish our society. And if you had we had just that, that would really uh, make our country. You know, this is not a simple you know, band-aid solution. This is something that probably will take several generations of practicing before we can um, go through and become a vibrant society that's functional. Yeah, so I, I'm with you. So here in Los Angeles, our 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 endless homeless, houseless situation is 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 a deep moral shame. And too often we we say, well, what's the federal government doing? What's the what's the governor doing? What's the mayor doing? And and too and too infrequently do we say, well, what am I doing? And 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 what you say, you're right. I think it would take generations. But the things that we have been doing have failed. I mean, at, at some point, we 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 either uh, either have to change course or just blind ourselves to it. Um, so you, you mentioned the murder of Masa Amini and the, the women-led protests in Iran, and I don't know how tied you in uh, you are to news in Iran, but but is in, is there any chance of real change with that still pretty repressive regime? There's always a chance, and there is a lot of hope. Iranians are uh, the demographics are very very young. You know, like they're 20, 60 percent or about 25 uh -huh. uh, or, or younger in Iran. So so there is a lot of uh, energy there. And one of my um, goals is to make activism sustainable because it seems that it's um, either like a marathon or a relay course where you get really tired afterwards and you need someone else to pick up the 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 baton and go and then you know and just get back into it when when you're nourished because what i see in the activist community here is that we get burnt out and i hope that this a similar thing happens in iran where uh, they become really smart about nourishing themselves and uh and honoring relationships to their own body and with each other so they can keep going because it i mean it's been 44 years of resistance almost 45 years of resistance in iran and uh, and the mullahs are still in charge, unfortunately. But one thing that I see that is not going back is the hijab. There is just mm -hmm. that part is something that they cannot oppress anymore, oppress women in that way anymore. There is acts of civil disobedience everywhere. And similar with singing and dancing and uh, freedom of expression, which I'm supporting from, from this side. Um, I started a project called Dance for Freedom uh, and uh, where people from seven continents joined and danced for Iranians uh, who, can't dance legally in, in the streets of Iran. And even in Antarctica, people were dance, are dancing and people, I'm still getting uh, videos from Africa, from Europe, from Central America, South America, of people dancing for Iran is because it's so inspiring. And dancing is such a sustainable activity that it nourishes you and uh, you're using your body as a way to amplify voices of the oppressed. Yeah, so I'm with you about the sustainability of, of protest. I mean, we had a, a great uprising against the Dobbs decision, the reversal of Roe v. Wade, and it affected some some elections a couple of years ago. But I but I wonder if that's going to persist. Will it be, do you think it'll continue? To, do you think we will continue to have pushback about against the current anti woke, anti woman, anti gay uh, movements? I believe we have to. This is not an option for us. Uh, right now, we have um, an estimated million LGBTQ people who are on the run from the red states and the laws, especially trans people. And uh, the way that they're just so, their rights were stripped away in a horrific way. 
and uh, we have women who are trying to scramble and find a way to leave the states just to have their reproductive rights. We have women who are losing, um, you know, probably have, many have lost their lives that we haven't even heard about so much and not, not in the news because of these restrictions, because politicians decided to uh, play um, amateur OBGYN and become uh, practice medicine without a license. So this is this is serious, something that we need to all pay attention to and uh, and then and just be really strategic and smart about it uh, that we fulfill our lives, we prioritize uh, what is important in our own life so we can have enough to give in the way of actis activism and being there for others. So as a final note, do you want to tell us a little bit about your novel, A Girl Called Rumi? Sure. Uh, a Girl Called Rumi is based on my experiences in post-revolution Iran and my run-ins with the morality police and the atmosphere where the war began with Iraq right after uh, the Islamists took over Iran and the war lasted eight years and destroyed millions of lives. So we were being attacked from the outside and from within there was an actual war and then there was a war on our civil liberties and a war on joy. And, uh, but one thing, you know, we always found ways to be resilient through joy. And this is a story of a boy and a girl based on me and my best friend who at nine years of age, who uh, meet a mysterious storyteller who takes us through this 900 year old myth, the seven valleys of love. And it is about looking within self-reflection and, uh, and finding ways, even at a small age of uh, at, at a young age of self-inquiry and being um, being responsible for for your own life. Well, thank you, Ari. Uh, I love that phrase of a war on joy, and I appreciate your your spending time with us. So, any final thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah. So, what is uh, easy is sustainable. So, and what is, and joy is such a sustainable fuel for going and, uh, you know, being there for others. So um, I encourage everyone to, to savor pleasant moments as a way to deal with challenges that we have in, in our lives and in our worlds.